Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning, and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness benefits your house, O Lord, forevermore. It is good and right that we should make confession of our sins. The section on confession in the small catechism informs and directs us with these words, which summarizes it well. Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins, and second, that we receive absolution. That is forgiveness from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. Humble yourselves then before God, confess your sins to him, and implore his forgiveness. O almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and penitent sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. By nature, I am a sinful creature, by thought, word, and deed. I have continually transgressed your law for the sake of the sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ. Be gracious and merciful to me, a penitent and contrite being. Forgive me all my sins, and grant me the power of your Holy Spirit that I may amend my sinful life. God be gracious to you and strengthen your faith. Amen. As you believe, so let it be. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord of all, let nothing interfere with our commitment to you. 
Give us that sense of priority that values all things properly and treasures nothing above Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our service of the Word begins with an Old Testament reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We now read from Psalm 119 responsibly. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our epistle reading comes from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day. 
today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the verse and the reading of the Holy Gospel. Alleluia. With man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible oh, with God. God. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. 
You may be seated, and children, with your parents' permission, you are invited forward for the children's message. Morning, boys and girls. When my son was uh, a little boy, uh, Mr. Boehner, would you put the picture on the screen? There it is. I gave him one of those. It's, I think it was called a Nerf Vortex. You ever seen one of those? Have you seen one? Uh, what's really cool about this toy is that you can throw it a long ways much farther than you would think you could throw it. And I looked for Joshua's, because I'm sure we, we gave him one a long time ago. I couldn't find it, and I think I, remember, I think I know why we couldn't find it. The reason we probably couldn't find it is because it's broken and gone. If I remember right, uh, the football on the end if you let it hit the ground, it would chip and break, and the, the tail on the back of it, if you held on to it incorrectly, it would, it would break and come off. And so I would bet that that toy is probably just broken and gone. You ever had a, a toy that breaks? Yeah, doesn't last like you'd hope it would, like you think it would. Uh, you, you drop it, or it just wears out, and you don't have it anymore. That's un unfortunately the way things are with the things of this world. What we have, because of the, the brokenness of our world, what we have wears out or breaks. It's just the way things are. That happens with our clothes. It happens with our toys. It even happens with our bodies. They wear out. They get sick. And someday we'll die. And that's just the nature of things here. They get broken. Uh, and that's the way it is. But I, can, I have good news for you today. There is something that uh, will never break, that will ne never wear out, and that's the love of Jesus. It will there be there for you always. Because if you think about Jesus, Jesus gave up heaven to come and be with us. Jesus would ultimately even give up his life. He would die so that we could be forgiven. And then he would rise on Easter, guaranteeing that these broken bodies will one day be fixed and restored and live with him forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the things we enjoy in this life, but always help us to remember uh, that they are not permanent, that they break, that they wear out, and we thank you for the one thing that does not, and that's the love of Jesus. We thank you for his forgiveness and for the, the life that he gives us now and forever that will never break. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, boys and girls. You may go back to your seats. We continue with the hymn, What is the World to Me?
mercy and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Our meditation this morning, again drawn from the Old Testament reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon declares the stuff of this world to all be vanity. Dear Christian friends, you probably need to be on the little older side uh, to know and remember what this means. Who knows what it is? <laughs> Robert, what is this? It's a Vulcan hand signal, and it means live long and prosper. Bach did that. Live long and prosper. That's kind of a, a, a nice sentiment, but you know what does it really mean? What does it mean to live long? That's a little bit subjective. I'm 64 years old, and some sitting here this morning would think that's pretty old, uh, but there are other, others of you who uh, think otherwise. And what does it mean to prosper? Uh, that all also is a bit of a, of a subjective thing. And the text that we have before us this morning, Solomon, will help us to understand what it means to prosper. Now this text, this book of Ecclesiastes, again, is written by King Solomon. It's important to remember that King Solomon is of unlimited resources, wisdom, and wealth, pleasure, and power are all there in abundance for Solomon. As an example, Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. I'm not sure how wise that is. He has mansions. He's built cities. He has countless horses and chariots, and his money is beyond our imagination. And yet, when he writes these words in Ecclesiastes, most think they're at the end of his life. Solomon writes them with sadness, with regret. He uses the word vanity in regards to the stuff of this world that has been so abundant for him. And by vanity, he means he's found no contentment, no meaning in all of it. In the end, it was all for Solomon empty. And yet, is that not the American way of life? We pile up wealth and prosperity. In fact, we pursue prosperity at a breakneck speed. And the examples of that abound. The lottery, for example, several billions of dollars spent every year in this pursuit of prosperity, often wasting the resources God has given that person to provide for their family. Even the winners most often report that they're not happier after winning. And a surprising number of these lottery winners end up in bankruptcy. Vanity, indeed. And then there is the American obsession, the American obsession with living beyond our means. It's living just beyond what we can actually afford and going into debt because of it, because we believe that we can buy happiness and prosperity. I'm embarrassed 
by the amount of junk in my basement. Vanity. All of it. Oh, to have the wisdom of Solomon. To understand before the end of our life the vanity of it all. I'll pick out a few of the things from the text. Verse 10, Solomon says, He who loves money will not be satisfied. He's asking the question, when are we rich enough? Because if money and possessions and prosperity is all that life is, if we aren't tied to something bigger than that, in the end, we'll find it all to be vanity, Solomon says. Or verse 11, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. The more we have, the more we are surrounded by people who want stuff from us. Or verse 13, riches are kept by their owner to his hurt. Riches can hurt? Yes with worry and anxiety and effort to protect and preserve that which is mine. Hurt? Yes. Remember the gospel reading from last Sunday. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus and asks, what do I need to do to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, sell all that you have. And because he was wealthy, because he was prosperous, he literally walked away from Jesus. Verse 17, Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. I'm reminded of Ebenezer Scrooge, who cares only for himself and who's facing dying alone, remembered by no one except his lifeless money. Vanity, indeed. But thanks be to God that he shows us the vanity of it all. And one of the ways he shows us the vanity of it all is to show us how small we really are. To show us that wealth can be a great deception, a great lie. That seeking prosperity on my terms in the end will prove to be vanity. But there's more. Not only does God show me how small I am and the things that I have, He also shows you and me how big He is. How big His love for us really is. How big is the prosperity that he would give us in Jesus Christ? You see, God has a prosperity that will never be a vanity. God has a prosperity that is guaranteed to you and to me today and tomorrow and forever, and will never be a vanity. It is the love he has shown us from a cross that forgives our sins, that gives us victory over sin and death and the grave forever. It is a prosperity that is filled with joy and security and peace like no stack of dollar bills ever could. Take the biblical example of Zacchaeus. 
Remember him, that wee little man we sang about his children? Zacchaeus came to understand the vanity of the things of this world. For Zacchaeus, earthly prosperity, the prosperity of his own making, had impoverished him before God and in his community. Zacchaeus' pockets were overflowing, but his heart was empty. And then Jesus finds Zacchaeus. Now understand what an amazing thing this is. What amazing grace this is. The God of Israel, the God of heaven, Yahweh himself makes a special journey to Jericho to find this one man named Zacchaeus. And he calls him by name. And Zacchaeus' earthly perception of prosperity is shattered. And it is replaced with the eternal prosperity that stands before him in the person of Jesus Christ. And Zacchaeus' whole life is changed. Zacchaeus becomes an instrument of God's prosperity in the world. Zacchaeus uses his money that was once was his idol. He now uses it to serve others. Not unlike Ebenezer Scrooge I mentioned earlier. Ebenezer Scrooge is spared a just end. And grace transforms him as well. And he uses the wealth that he has accumulated to bless his community and particularly the Cratchit family. We have received <laughs> infinitely more than Ebenezer Scrooge. We didn't get a wake-up call in a dream. We got a substitute who went to the cross and took all of our sin and paid its price completely and given us a prosperity that will last forever. He stood in the place of misers like you and me who cling so tightly to our stuff and he paid our penalty and then he rose as our lavishly generous king who bestows on us forgiveness and eternal life that never will be taken from us. Jesus called you by name, much like he did Zacchaeus. In your baptism, by name, God claimed you as his own. And you have found prosperity in God's love for you at a cross. And you know that what Paul says of Christ is true. For you know, Paul says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Yes, my friends in Christ, we belong to Christ. True prosperity, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, God gives to you and me in Jesus Christ. And now we rejoice in the privilege to be used by God to be a blessing to others with the wealth that God has given us to manage. Yes, in Christ, true prosperity is ours, and it 
will never be taken from us, and it will never be a vanity for you and for me in Christ, in his forgiveness, we will live long and prosper. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We stand and sing as the offering is brought forward. Let us pray. Most high and holy God, we humbly ask you to accept these your own gifts that we offer to you. And here we would present and yield ourselves to you, asking you to make us true members incorporated in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that in the communion with your whole church, we may make a pure offering to your name. O oh Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come to you. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, for the universal church, that you will confirm it in the truth of your holy faith, inspire it with unity and concord, and extend and prosper it throughout the world. We pray you for those who are ordained to be ministers in your church, that by their life and doctrine, they set forth your true and living word and rightly administer your holy sacraments. Especially do we call upon you for those who labor for you in challenging settings, that they be strong and steadfast, abounding in your work. O oh Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come unto you. Bless, we pray you, our schools, hospitals, homes for the aged, and all our institutions. Bless those who minister to the human need, whether of body, mind, or spirit, and grant them wisdom, strength, and love for you and all people. Let your blessing rest upon the seed time and harvest, commerce and industry, leisure and rest, and the arts and culture of our people. Take upon your special protection those whose toil is difficult or dangerous, and be with all who put their efforts toward any useful task. Give to all people the mind of Christ, and order our days in righteousness. Take from us all hatred and prejudice, and whatever may hinder justice and love 
among people everywhere. O Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come unto you. Remember the nations of the world, and let concord and peace prevail among them. Remember those who rule over us, and guide those who influence our lives through the media. Remember our children, our youth, the married couples, and those living single lives, the widows and orphans, and all those who are dealing with disappointments in life. Remember the sick, the suffering, and the persecuted and the dying. Especially we remember before you Dave Nadler, Addison, Jim Groney, Noah Walters, and the persecuted church around the world. Send them help from your sanctuary, and by your spirit strengthen them according to your gracious will. O Lord, hear our prayer, and let our cry come unto you. In this time of prayer, we commemorate your blessed apostles and martyrs and all the saints who have gone before us with the sign of faith and are at peace. We praise you for the mercy and blessings shown them in their lifetimes and pray you to grant us to rejoice with them forever in your kingdom. O Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come unto you. Finally, O Lord, we pray for ourselves and for all who confess the name of Christ that we show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Grant that we who now celebrate this blessed feast at your altar may, at the close of this present age, be clothed with the white robes of those who shall join the marriage supper of the Lamb eternally. O Lord, hear our prayer and let our cry come unto you. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing.